Welcome to Lockdown Anatomy with me, Alice Roberts. I am a clinical anatomist. That means I'm medically trained and I have studied the structure of the human body in a huge amount of detail, uh, involving quite a bit of human dissection over the years. But in these videos, I'm using a fantastic anatomy app called Complete Anatomy to explore the wonderful detail and intricate structure of the human body. I've designed these videos with medical students in mind, but I hope they're useful for many others, perhaps if you're brushing up on your anatomy or you're just interested in the structure of your own body. I've done a series of videos already on the arm, I'd call it the upper limb as an anatomist, and now I'm moving down the body and we're going to look at the lower limb or the leg. In this first lower limb video, I'm going to look at all the bones. That's a great place to start. It gives us a scaffold to hang all the other anatomy from. So we'll work our way down from the hip down to the toes using complete anatomy. So here is a little model of the skeleton of one leg or a little one-legged skeleton if you prefer and we're going to run through the bones which make up the lower limb including the pelvis because the bony pelvis is what attaches the free bones of the lower limb to the spine. So there's the pelvis, the femur in the thigh, the tibia and the fibula in your leg between your knee and your ankle. Once we get down to the ankle we're going to have to zoom in a bit because we've got a whole bunch of bones there and these form the tarsus and we call them the tarsal bones. Then there's a set of five metatarsals and then the phalanges. So you might remember the similarity there with the pattern of bones in the hand with the carpals, the metacarpals and the phalanges. Let's have a look at the pelvis in a bit more detail. The other name for this is the innominate bone and I think that's because it doesn't really look like anything so it's impossible to give it a name. And you can see there that I've drawn some dotted lines inside the hip socket because actually this innominate bone is composed of three separate bones. The ilium at the top there, the pubis in the front and the ischium underneath. And actually when you're a child those are completely separate, those three bones, and they're joined by cartilage in that hip socket and you can also see a joint between the pubis and the ischium at the front there. But when you're adult all of those fuse together. Let's have a look at some of the features of these individual bones then. The top of the ilium is the iliac crest and you can feel that really easily on yourself if you press in at your waist and then down, you're pushing down on your iliac crest. The crest finishes at the front at the anterior superior iliac spine. Bit of a mouthful so we tend to call it the asis. And that's a bony landmark that again is very easy to feel on yourself at the front of the pelvis. Just below that is the anterior inferior iliac spine or AIIS. It seems like we're paying a lot of attention to bumps and lumps on bones, but they're important because they're where muscles and ligaments attach and we'll meet them again. Now let's have a look at the pubis, the body of the pubis there at the front, which unites with the body of the pubis on the other side at the symphysis, the superior pubic ramus or branch and the inferior pubic ramus. So you can see that superior pubic ramus heading upwards to expand into the hip socket and the inferior pubic ramus travels down to unite with the ischium. Let's have a look at the ischium then. The chunky body of the ischium is at the back there. And then there's an ischial ramus, so that's travelling up to join the inferior pubic ramus. And actually, as those two rami are fused together in an adult pelvis, we usually call that part of the bone the ischiopubic ramus. And it helps to frame the obturator foramen, which is this hole in the pelvis. Obturator is a bit of a strange word. It actually means plugged or stopped up and it is covered, so it is covered with a membrane first of all and then muscles on either side of that. So let's have a look at the remaining parts of the ischium then. The ischial tuberosity is the part of the bone that you sit on, so if you're sitting down there and you just feel underneath your bum you might be able to feel up and feel the lump of the ischial tuberosity in there. And then up there that's the spine of the ischium, that's an important site for a ligament to attach to. That is now looking fairly crowded, so I'm going to turn the bone around. We'll look at the ischial spine again, but also note how that divides up the back of the pelvic bone. And we've got these notches, quite a deep notch just above it. And that is called the greater sciatic notch. The word sciatic actually comes from the same root as ischium, meaning to do with the hip. And then just below the ischial spine is the lesser sciatic notch and these are quite important to remember when we start to look at some of the muscles and nerves of the pelvis. 
up there is the oracle on this inner or internal surface of the pelvis and that's where the pelvis attaches to the sacrum at the sacroiliac joint. We can also see some features of the pubic bone as well. There's the facet that will form the pubic symphysis, the joint between the two pubic bones. That's a secondary cartilaginous joint with fibrocartilage in it. And just about a centimetre away from the pubic symphysis is the pubic tubercle, a little bump on the bone, which is an important site for ligaments to attach to. Spinning it round, we've missed a quite large and prominent feature of the pelvis, and that is the socket of the hip joint. It's called the acetabulum. It's a great word. Acetabulos means vinegar bowl. And it's even got what looks like a little spout at the front there where the margins of the acetabulum dip down, forming the acetabular notch. And that acetabular notch is bridged by a ligament. I think we can leave the pelvis now and move on to the next bone. It's the bone which articulates with the pelvis. It is the femur. So we can put that in place and we can see how the head of the femur fits snugly and quite deeply into that acetabulum. So there's the femoral head, the femoral neck just below it, the greater trochanter, which is an important site for muscle attachment, the lesser trochanter on the medial surface. And between the two, a line joining them, the intertrochanteric line. If we spin the bone around the back and have a look at the posterior surface, we can see there's an even more prominent feature joining the two trochanters. So this is the intertrochanteric crest on the back of the bone. Now we're looking at the back, the posterior surface of the femur as a whole. Down at the bottom there, we've got condyles, the knuckles of the bone. And the medial and the lateral condyle are the parts of the femur which contribute to the knee joint. On the outside, we've got epicondyles, the medial and lateral epicondyles, and these are away from the articular surface itself and sites for muscle attachment, as is the adductor tubercle, a very specific site for attachment of adductor magnus. In between the condyles, there's a dip, the intercondylar fossa. On the back of the bone, there's a very prominent ridge running down, and that's called the linear aspera, or the rough line. And that relates to muscle attachments around the bone. Looking at that lower end again and turning the bone round, you can see how the articular surfaces on the condyles run onto the front of the bone to form the patella surface, which is where the kneecap or patella articulates with the femur. Now we're going to look at the bottom of the bone, those condyles in a different view, an inferior view, and you can see that there's a, a valley, the patella groove, flanked by two lips on either side, a medial lip and a lateral lip, and the lateral lip is higher, and that's really important for stabilisation of the patella at the knee. Let's have a look at this little bone, this kneecap. It's actually embedded in the quadriceps tendon. If we turn it around and have a look on the back, we can see that it presents two facets and a point, and the apex is at the bottom. So the two facets are the medial and the lateral facet. You can see that the lateral facet is larger, corresponding with that taller lip of the patella sulcus or patella groove. And that actually helps to stop the patella dislocating because the quadriceps muscle tends to produce a lateral force on the patella. Time for the next bone. Let's disappear the femur and the patella, get rid of the fibula, get rid of the foot as well, and we're left with the tibia or the shin bone. Having a look at the top there, it's quite flat, the tibial plateau, which is where the condyles of the femur articulate with it. And in the centre of that tibial plateau, there's a little prominence, the intercondylar eminence where some ligaments attach. On the front of the bone, we can see the tibial tuberosity, and that's where the patella ligament inserts, which is really the extension of the quadriceps tendon. This surface of the bone, the medial surface, lies just under the skin with nothing protecting it, the medial subcutaneous surface of the tibia. So if you've ever done anything like walk into a bed and bash your shin, it really hurts, and that's because there's nothing protecting the bone at that point. Down at the bottom of the tibia, we've got the medial malleolus, and that helps to stabilise the ankle joint. Now I'm going to spin the tibia around 90 degrees so that we're looking at the side of it, the lateral side of it, because here we find facets for attachment to the fibula. So there's a facet up the top there and another one down the bottom. Now spinning the bone around to the back to the posterior surface we can see the salial line where one of the calf muscles called salaeus attaches to the bone. Right it's time to move on to the next bone in the leg and that is the fibula, the bone which looks like a brooch pin lying alongside the shin bone. There's the head of the fibula, the neck, 
the shaft of the bone, it has a triangular cross section. And then down the bottom, it forms the lateral malleolus. So of those knobbly bits at your ankle, the medial malleolus is part of the tibia and the lateral malleolus part of the fibula. Let's spin that around then, have a look at the ankle joint in a bit more detail. You can see how the fibula and the tibia are gripping that very top bone of the foot, the talus, and that helps to stabilise the ankle joint. There's a tibia and the fibula and the talus just underneath them, which is held in place quite nicely by those two malleoli. Now it's time to get rid of the tibia and the fibula and that leaves us with the bones of the ankle and the foot. There's the talus, underneath that is the calcaneus which also sticks out the back to form the prominence of your heel. The navicular bone there on the medial side, the cuboid on the lateral side. And then we have a series of wedge shaped bones, the lateral intermediate and medial cuneiforms. That's all the tarsals, then these five are the metatarsals. And then finally, the phalanges. And the pattern here is exactly the same as in the hand. So three phalanges in the second toe through to the fifth toe or little toe. And then in the great toe or big toe, there are just two phalanges, the proximal and the distal phalanx, just like the thumb in the hand. So we see that pattern repeating itself here. Right then, we've done it. We've gone all the way from the pelvis down to the tips of the toes, and that means that in the next video, we can start to put some flesh on those bones. Thank you for joining me on that tour of the bones of the lower limb, all the way from hip to toes. Next time, I'll start looking at individual joints and the muscles that move them. Thank you very much for your attention over these minutes. I hope that you've enjoyed it and got something from it. Do like, do share, please share it. I'd like these to be um, as useful as they possibly can be to as many people. And if you've got particular comments or those things that you'd like me to cover as well, um, then leave those comments as well. I do, I do look at all those comments that come in via YouTube. Thank you very much for watching.